when you say it's one, that does is is sort of like in juxtaposition with saying we all believe here that this industry is so small and is a speck of dust as a NASA class. So you can't really say it's like won the battle. Like, like, you know what I mean? I, this is why I struggle with any sort of maximalism thinking here, which is God, like it is so hard to build in crypto because you don't understand the real user base. God damn it. There's like 10 people using DeFi protocols and a couple, maybe a million people using NFTs. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's nothing. What's going on, guys? Want to give a quick shout out to this episode's sponsor, Curve. They are the one-stop shop credit cards that helps you take control of your personal finances. All right, everyone. Welcome back to the inaugural uh, cross episode of On the Empire. Didn't really work super wow. well, but uh, wow. this is the mashup that we've been trying to do for a long time. <laughs> uh, so we got... Yeah, I did. We've got the debonair Santiago. Santiago, I always give Mark uh, an adjective. Uh, so you're getting debonair today. And I'm going to get the hopeful Mark Yusko because we've been doing Sunrise Saturdays. And then we've got Yano. Hey, buddy. Wow. Ah, no, <laughs> no, no adjective. All right. And, and just to get it out of the way, out of the way. And usually I would get colorful, but I'm, I'm wearing this this drab sweater. Why? Well, when I wanted to match Mike. Um, but I'm going to do the, the reveal. So the quick one, yes, so I do I have, I do have the Bitcoin pants on, reveal. I have the orange pants, but I have the on-chain monkeys rise uh, bananas uh, sock, sock game today. And that's, you know, one, because I love on-chain monkeys and, and two, Web3 is a big, a big topic. Uh, but I do have the Bitcoin pants on because we are going to talk about predictions and certainly we're going to probably talk about Bitcoin. But I had on a purple sweater and my wife said, no, no. You look like a Clemson fan. No, not in our house. Are you going to look like a Clemson fan? So I had to change my sweater. So Does she, doesn't she know though, Mark? Purple is the Blockworks color. You got to come rep the brand, you know? Oh, yeah. See? Next time. Dang, well, I, have, I do I do have the purple gingham on. Yeah, so there you go. There I'm repping. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad uh, every week, every week this year, I've watched Mark stand on that chair on one foot and experience anxiety. So, you know, I'm in Santiago. I'm glad you guys get to experience this with me here. I want to put like a little bow on 2022 so we can move on to predictions for 2023. Um, if I had to summarize basically this year, I think <laughs> to use a phrase from one of our producers at Blockworks, we were sitting down to a banquet of consequences uh, basically from the last two years previous. So I think the story of crypto, the story of macro broadly has been uh, the Fed has probably debatably overcorrected to an enormous amount of liquidity that they injected into the system in starting in March of 2020 with the COVID crisis. They realized that inflation was more persistent and sticky than they otherwise realized, and they've been trying to walk that back for the entire year. To translate how that's impacted crypto, you basically saw a lot of the most frothy speculative excesses start to get start to crumble one by one, and we've started to figure out that crypto was more systemically weak, specifically around leverage and CFI, than we thought. So let me just trace this year. Basically, everything everything peaked price-wise in, in November of 2021. We've been on a steady decline ever since. Uh, and that has led to ultimately the blow up of Terra, Terra Luna back in May of this year. We found out that a lot of crypto systemic institutions, both uh, extremely leveraged hedge funds, but also ultimately FTX and Alameda were extremely exposed uh, to that. So we've basically seen the implosion of CFI ever since. Um, and we've seen an enormous amount of leverage that was taken out of the system. And so we're kind of sitting here in, we're recording this on December 23rd, 2022. And it's been in some ways, not a particularly great uh, year for, for crypto. But honestly, I'm going to sit here and say I'm very optimistic for this coming year. So I, I've got a couple predictions that I'd love to share. But guys, any other commentary on the year? Anything that that we might have missed? Because that was a uh, it's hard to summarize this entire year in just yeah. one paragraph like that. I think uh, the only thing I'd say is when I, I've been around for since 2012 and I've seen two broad, like really cycles, I guess, in crypto um, was 2014 and then 2017. And I think a lot of times people want to get that perspective in terms of how this compares to prior cycles. And, you know, I think the, the biggest thing here has been on one end, it's very positive. I agree with you, Michael, that we started to see like real use cases, like when you crypto migrating from what has been largely institution, like infrastructure deployment into what is now felt more tangible use cases, largely NFTs. Because uh, DeFi is really hard for people to imagine, like when you look at number of users. Um, 
And I don't think that goes away. I think there are a lot of bad problems that have been exposed in crypto, largely recursive leverage, translating traditional financial practices into crypto that have been largely rejected. If you look at all the collapses, it's been you, lack of transparency and a lot of things that led to the global financial crisis. We've had kind of the global financial crisis moment of this industry, the Lehman of the world collapsing, this is FTX and Three Arrows and a bunch of other funds and that contagion. Um, but, you know, you have DeFi shining in many ways and reinforcing the need for decentralization. So I agree with you, I think. Uh, but we're in a state where a lot of people have turned sour, negative, are leaving the industry. And rightfully so. I mean, I think they'll come back at some point. But uh, but yeah, I think this is I've been I've been very disappointed um, and largely caught off guard, you know, with FTX, really. I mean, I, I was not expecting that. Uh, the level of fraud that that was happening and 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 it's been a bit of a disillusionment uh even though i continue to believe very much in this technology it is really hard to see the level of wealth destruction across millions of people uh because you know crypto continues to gain adoption and so uh, i think we can all learn from this and 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 hopefully avoid the same mistakes going forward i think we will I think I think my reflection on this year actually is a maybe a more optimistic one. Um, we've had four. We've had four. This is the fourth bear market in crypto. So 2011 fell from 32 bucks to to a dollar. Um, 2014 falls from I think it was like a thousand bucks to somewhere around 200. Uh, 2018 falls from 20k to 3k, and and now we're we've fallen from what is it 68k to whatever Bitcoin's at today. Um, this is the first bear market in history where people have not thought that the industry is done. So I remember 2018, 2019 bear market, even sitting down with Mike and, you know, I hate to admit it, but like occasionally after a couple of beers, we would ask ourselves if crypto goes away, what would we go do? Well, Jason and would, I never did. I was a true believer <laughs> the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm sure. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but in every of the, every single one of the last bear markets, people would ask themselves, is, is this is this industry going away? And no, people are leaving. Santi's right. The disheartened are walking away. Nobody's asking themselves, is crypto here to stay? Nobody's saying like, will NFTs come back? There's just an inherent understanding that the industry will recover. And that is a really unique thing that's never happened before. So I have a actually strangely optimistic view going into next year. Yeah, I totally echo that sentiment. And I'm going to wrap it back to the, to the macro piece, Michael, in that Look, the, the Mt. Gox thing in 2014, way worse, like orders of magnitude worse than, than the FTX debacle. And look, I don't want to minimize the fact that, that $9 billion is a meaningful amount of money, but it's not relative to a trillion dollar industry, first of all. Second, it is not unusual to have centralized institutions fail. We've had 523, I think is the number, banks fail since the global financial crisis. <laughs> Forget the, the things that happened in the global financial crisis, but since then, there've been 523 banks that have gone away. The other thing is when Mt. Gox went under, there was no really other viable options for exchanges. I mean, it was it. Now there are 499 other exchanges. And look, we can, I don't want to go down the, the rabbit hole on this. And, and I would like to leave this, you know, this perpetrator in, in the rear view mirror and not even mention his name. But the, the issue for me is, as, as Yano said, the, the positivity of the technology has been acknowledged. The flight of talent into the industry is here to stay. That's all hugely positive. The, the wrapping it back to the macro stuff is I agree that the, the banquet of consequences is a really apt description because look, the Fed created this mess, the Fed and all the other central banks around the world, by having emergency policies long after the emergency. And, and why did they do that? Right? Well, they did that to reliquify the bank balance sheets. The bank balance sheets were horrific. Right. There's a reason the Genesis block has the you know, chance of bailing out the banks for the second time. There's a reason that Bitcoin was created right in the middle of the global financial crisis. It wasn't created on that day. 
it was ready for some period of time, a year, two years, whatever it was. It was released on that day for a reason. And so if you think about the, the destruction that's been caused by the withdrawal of that excess liquidity in terms of market cap, right? Fangman alone has lost close to four trillion. Four trillion. Like, just think about that. We're talking seven stocks have wiped out four trillion dollars of wealth. And, you know, someone was trying to make, I, I, who was it? It was, um, oh, Wapner, when he was picking on Pomp on, on TV, trying to say that, you know, people have lost so much money in crypto. I'm like, dude, judge, people lost more money in Amazon this year than the entire crypto industry. <laughs> That's actually a pretty nuts statistic. Okay. This is a fact, right? Amazon went down 50, 50%, five percent and everybody owned it. Everybody owned it because it's in every index fund, which everybody owns. So I'm, I'm going to come back to, to the macro, which is we are likely in a recession. Be like, no, Mark, we're not. You know, look, at, look at the number yesterday. The GDP was so high, 3.2%. Like, no, it wasn't. GDP was negative. The only reason we had a 3.2% print is because they released a bunch of oil from the SPR and counted it again for the second time. They, they counted it when they produced it. Now they're counting it again when they sell it as net exports. That's just tomfoolery, right? That's, that's not real. Same thing has happened in the fourth quarter, and it's going to be a positive number. First quarter is going to be a wipeout. It's going to be a wipeout bad number because we have seasonality. We got polar vortexes. We got global growth slowing. It's going to be a wipeout. Earnings are going to be a wipeout. Anyway, so that's a, that's a presage of my, my predictions. Can I actually, I'd, I'd like to jump in here because I, all, everything that we've talked about so far actually kind of forms this, uh, this first prediction that, that I laid out. Um, and so I'd like to maybe just like transition now from talking to 2022 about 2023, because I know we have all put thought into this. I want to make sure we've got time to get through everyone's. So uh, I know this is going to sound like hopium, but I backed it up. I actually put some slides together. Uh, I think that the bottom is in for crypto, but I don't think it's in for equities. So uh, this is what I basically, I've got some slides here to back up Two this, thumbs uh, way up. this, this hopium chart here. Let me see if I can share. All right. So, uh, this is basically what I think, I think, um, to knit what the debate actually marked that you and, and, uh, Santiago were having earlier this episode, I think right now that you can make a pretty strong argument that crypto has been moving off the back of interest rates. It's kind of this whole thing this year. Everything is one trade. Uh, what we're looking at right now is the correlation between liquidity and the S and P 500. But if you looked at Bitcoin, it looks like a very similar chart. But I think an important thing to understand in this dynamic is that crypto front runs expectations around liquidity. So basically everything that ends up happening in the broader market, crypto experiences a couple months beforehand. And if you actually, I couldn't find a way to match these things up, but if you actually went and looked at the price action, basically Bitcoin and crypto will lead what ends up ultimately happening in the S&P 500 and NASDAQ, which is driven by interest rates. Um, I... Importantly, I think one of the dynamics that's changed here is that dynamic has broken. Like if you look at the last squiggles, basically August on through this chart, there's a very tight correlation between what's going on with liquidity and the S&P 500. That breaks uh, around post-May, basically in crypto, as two important dynamics have taken hold, which is A, crypto is being driven by fundamental dynamics in our space more than liquidity. They're not great dynamics. Everything's collapsing, but they're still being driven more by crypto fundamental dynamics. And also this like macro holder base of crypto, which was enforcing this relationship between liquidity and interest rates in crypto, they've largely exited the space. So right now, what you have is a more uh, retail kind of holder base of crypto, uh, which is evidenced by this great chart that Coinmetrics put together, which is MVRV. So to just give you guys an understanding of what this is, MVRV is market value versus realized value. Market value is just market cap. It's the current price times the circulating supply. Realized value is an interesting metric that is proprietary to coin metrics. Basically, what they're looking at is the on-chain price that Bitcoin last changed hands at times the circulating supply. So really what it is, is basically a cost basis. And the assumption here is that the changes in crypto price act or Bitcoin's price action is driven by speculators. So when you have a high MVRV, uh, that's basically a, an indication that speculators are in control and it's probably marking a top. And then when MVRV is low, 
you're seeing mostly holders that are controlling the market. And that is typically marking a bottom. As you can see here, we are in a historically low uh, period of this measure of MVRV. The last time we basically bottomed in MVRV was uh, late 2018, early 2019. If you want to look at what happened to Bitcoin's price after that low of MVRV in 2019, it's basically up only till the next bull market. Now, I'm not necessarily predicting this, but it is interesting to note that we kind of generally- Oh, yes, you are. Yes, you are. That's the whole I, point that's, of the show. That's, you are I think predicting this, it. That's your that's prediction. True. I think this. I think ultimately what happens to Bitcoin and crypto prices over the next 12 months looks more like this chart than down only. And one of the things that Jason and I have talked about a lot is that a funny dynamic, people just kind of look back at 2018 and 2019, if you were in that bear market, as being this bleak landscape. But there were price fluctuations of up to, literally, you can see this chart, you know, five, 5,000 up to almost 15,000, right? You know, 200, you know, 150 to 200% basically price moves. And I think what we were sort of waiting for is, look, the market sentiment has to get so bad that Bitcoin could double and no one would be calling for a bull market. I think we're almost there. I think we are basically flirting with it. That kind of uh, negativity, uh, like disillusionment, Santiago, that you were talking about. I think that sentiment broadly was necessary to find a market bottom. So basically, I'm what I'm saying here is, Mark, I agree with you on everything that you just said. I think Q1 is going to be horrendous for stocks. Everything that's reset in terms of the NASDAQ and the S&P has been in valuation terms, not in earnings terms. But I think crypto is basically front ran that. And I think the worst is basically in for crypto. I'll caveat by saying... If DCG blows up tomorrow or Tether or Binance, we could see a leg lower, but I don't think we sustainably see lows from here for much longer. So that's my prediction yeah. for my first prediction. No, I, I want to second that emotion and, and then throw it back to you guys on the empire side uh, to, to, to comment. But I will echo it with one caveat, well, the, the, the second caveat. So the first caveat is clearly if, if DCG goes, goes bust, uh, and Genesis tumbles and Tether turns out to be a total fraud, which it probably is. Um, probably not total fraud, but but probably bad guys doing bad stuff. Um, it, I, 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 I heard a great line or saw a great line today, uh, fraud Ahamas, um, that the Bahamas are, are basically the haven for fraudsters. Uh, always has been. Uh, money laundering and all kinds of good stuff. But um, the second caveat is we need an adoption mechanism to drive adoption, right? And in the early you know, bull market in kind of 15, 16 into 17, uh, it was just the first introduction into a wallet. And you know, whether it was a hot, hot wallet or in some cases, a ledger or something like that. Um, in 2019, 20, was all about GBTC. And in the absence of an adoption mechanism, it's hard to get the fulfillment of the, the cycle. So while I, I've, like I said, crypto winter ended in June, we're in crypto spring, crypto spring lasts till you know April next year, and then we get to crypto summer, the, the, the angle of ascent of crypto summer has to do with the ability of the masses to have adoption. It ain't going to be GBTC at a 50% pre discount. It's just not. So we need something else to get the capital into Bitcoin. Mm. Empire, guys, I want, I want to turn it over to, to you here because I've got like a, an additional list of stuff. But what are you, I'm, I'm curious, like what, what are you guys, Jason, maybe I'll, I'll call on you here to, to go first. I'd love to hear what you're thinking about. So I don't know if Santi, it looked like Santi had a thought on that. Uh, no. All right, cool. Um, well, first, first off, I really agree with your prediction, Mike. I think that uh, one, it's just interesting to point out how it how it leads the market um, and leads equities. I think that's a great point. And the second thing is, uh, yeah, I actually, I really do think we'll see these, like, I don't know, like pr the, the price action, you know, whether it's like Bitcoin going from 15 to 30 or something, and no one will blink an eye and no one will even really talk about the price. And uh, yeah, th these like big, I think big bear market runs will, will end up happening as well. Ultimately, it kind of goes up, comes down, goes up, comes down till it finds a big bottom. But um, my, all right, my first prediction is I think we see the kings of both trading and NFTs lose market share. So mm -hmm. 
uh, I would I would bucket this into like trading being like uh, the exchanges and then NFTs. Um, so first off, I think Uniswap passes Coinbase in volume in 2023. Um, I have another thesis about like fat wallets and how like wallets will be the new, they'll be the new wallet wars, but we can talk about that in a second. I think C5 fail, uh, the C5 failure is going to drive a bunch of users into self-custody wallets uh, and uh, basically just off of exchanges. And so if you actually look at the a ratio that I'm looking at is DEX, uh, like decentralized exchanges to centralized exchanges, the, the ratio of volume to both of those. Back in uh, DeFi summer, is that like 15, 16% was the high. Today, it's at around like 8 to 10%. I think we ultimately hit about 25% in 2023, which would be roughly like two and a half times where we're at right now. So I think Uniswap volumes today sometimes occasionally pass Coinbase in 2023. I think they really do overtake them. I think that is also driven by Uniswap's uh, push into NFTs. So first off, Unis like DEXs end up passing the biggest US, Uniswap ends up passing the biggest US exchange. That's the first one. On that note, uh, I think OpenSea ends up falling in market share. So right now you had like in the, in the bull run, OpenSea had like a 75 to roughly 80% market share. Today they have like a 40 to 50% market share. I think that market share ends up coming down to like, let's say 25% for a couple of reasons. One introduction of professional trading experiences in nfts like blur uh uniswap launching nfts there are all these like iterations and experiments and like i, I don't know if these things will end up making it but like pseudo swap for kind of the amm style floor trading nfts i think you'll see vertical specific uh vertical specific exchanges in, in nfts right like music uh gaming fashion i think these will all get actually their own um, exchanges and steal market share from OpenSea. I think brands will keep launching their own uh, white labeled marketplaces using things like Rarible, kind of like what Nike did. Um, and I think OpenSea will just, the last thing is, I think they're going to continue to face this really difficult challenge uh, on the royalty side of things, right? Where you have a direct trade off between attracting trading volume and then protecting artists and creators. So, I think there are some headwinds on, on the open sea side of things. So th that that's that's the first my first big prediction is that the kind of the kings of trading and kings of NFTs, open sea and Coinbase lose market share. Yeah, I think there's a I think there's a huge void in the market in terms of filling the liquidity that has evaporated from the market. Um, you could argue it's gonna come both from DeFi and CeFi. Uh, DeFi has been in bear market long before rates and inflation started to kick in, in in March of this year and uh, you know, in November where you sort of topped, um, uh, crypto topped. Um, yeah, I think, uh, the more interesting things that I'm looking at, um, you know, I looked at my predictions in 2022 and the things that I got right and then wrong, the thing that was most exciting that continues to be exciting, but didn't really took off as much as I thought it would was stable coin circulation. Um, I think still stable coins continue to be the biggest customer acquisition and on ramps into crypto because it's just such a killer use case. You don't have to sell anything other than people want to hold dollars. I don't, I don't buy this argument that the dollar is going to lose its like power in the world. Um, as other currencies have in, in other prior empires of this, this rule of like 70 to 80 years, I think dollars continue to be the preferred currency will continue to be that. I think the U S demographically will continue to be the strongest country. Um, I don't buy this argument that's going to collapse. Um, and so for that reason, like if you look at that stable coin adoption, it went from basically nothing in 2020 to like 5 billion in 2021. So 5x increase from 2021 to 2022, you saw those like 10x increase from 5 billion to like 180 billion. And I would have thought that you would have reached a trillion this year and you didn't. Uh, and there's a couple of reasons for that. One, I think this recursive leverage really dried up. Um, a lot of people were borrowing in stables and, and using that. So that wiped out. And then obviously UST, like, you know, Terra's native algorithmic stablecoin wiped off 20 billion off of that. And so you, you sort of like the value proposition of algorithmic stablecoins is largely gone. But I think it really puts, um, you know, the USCC, maybe central bank digital currencies take us to a trillion. And I think that's both highly positive for the space. So I, I think I was off in terms of timing, but as I look into next year, I think stable coins will continue to be a primary driver for, for growth in the industry uh, and usability. Um, largely will come from like highly regulated stable coins like USDC. Uh, so I think that's going to drive a lot of um, a lot of adoption and, and also 
probably stimulate. I think DeFi is set for a resurgence um, insofar as you have regulatory clarity that I think is coming. Um, and I think just clarity alone, irrespective of how bad or good, like I think just from my vantage point, talking to a lot of institutions at this point, to your point that you made at the very beginning, Jason, I think overwhelmingly more people are now, a majority of people are now in the camp of, yeah, we kind of do believe that this is real and that this could credibly be the next rail of finance. Uh, understand there's a big distinction between FTX and de- and the need for, and under that underscoring the need for decentralization. You see players like Visa actually building in the space, JP Morgan's of the world. Um, I think that doesn't go away. I don't think there's just pure marketing fluff that you saw in 2018. I think there's real building on interest, but everyone's on the sidelines. Like you look at what, our conversation with Eric Peters, he said, look, I love, I just have to stick to Bitcoin and ETH because I'm worried about the regular, you know, touching this stuff because I don't know what that has from a, like implications to my business. And so I think next year will be largely guided by regulation. And as soon as we get some regulation and just clarity, I think we'll open up the space for probably what will look like a permission DeFi in the sense of like KYC and just knowing your counterparty, but making a very big distinction between what is custodial and non-custodial, what is a protocol and what is a a, a service, if you will. And I think regulators, I think the, the blessing in disguise from the FTX fallout is it is it will make it very clear what is centralized and what is decentralized and what is custodial and what is non-custodial and the places where you need to patch and create regulation and where you don't. And I think when I listen to Bloomberg, when I listen to the commentary of people assessing and diagnosing what went wrong with FTX, surprisingly, I think most people kind of really do under, understand like, yeah, I think we do need to bring more transparency and decentralization and regulating certain pieces, but not all of crypto. And I think that is perhaps what makes me most excited about while the FTX thing is very painful, I think it has been and will be a key defining moment of one removing a bad actor in the space that was actually trying to introduce really bad regulation that would hurt decentralization, actually. He was a very toxic force in DC, trying to buy influence and, and introduce bills that were going to try to undermine and, and probably kill the value proposition and viability of DeFi. And I think that opens up a very interesting vector to to take back the reins of like really good organizations like the BlockFi Association that are actually trying to to educate but also introduce sensible policy that is, you know, that can all the institutional players that are on the sidelines will finally be able to interact in the space. And I think that will hopefully come true in the next 12 months. Yeah. Look, I, I... I, uh, I I don't want to shift because, Michael, you labeled me hopeful at the beginning. So I don't want to shift all the way to sinister. But <laughs> but I got I got to add some sinister here. That, that because, was quick, Mark. That was a quick. No, no, look, <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it look um, what Santiago brings up is is at the core of, of all of this. And, and look, I, I'm not going to go all the way into the complete sinister. But but we've talked about this from you know over and over that that we are in the then they fight you stage, and you know 2009 to 15, first they laugh at you. No, I mean I'm sorry, first they ignore you, right? They just a bunch of nerds and geeks playing through magic internet money. Who cares? 16 to 21, then they laugh at you. A bunch of nerds and geeks playing through magic internet money. Ha 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 ha. Not not real. 2022 to 2027, unfortunately, probably uh, then they fight you. And I, I will take the other side. SBF is the mastermind of nothing. Caroline, mastermind, of, they are not masterminds. They are useful idiots. That legislation didn't come from him. It came from the top. That is the incumbents, the banks, and the regulators trying to do exactly, as you said, to cancel this, this incredible technology that, that replaces trust with truth. And look, that is a monster, monster transition that is going to happen. We talked about the red flag law, right? No one's ever seen anyone walking in front of a car with a red flag. No one listening to this podcast has ever seen that. 
But that was the law at the turn of the century when the automobile was created. The you know, horse and buggy people went and paid big money to the New York regulators to get them to pass a law. They said you had to hire a human to carry a red flag in front of your car so you didn't, you know, run into anybody. Wait, and really? that's exactly never what's about happening that. here. That's actually wild. Oh, really? <laughs> that, no, this, wild. This, this no, is where the red flag comes from. Yeah. Um, oh, all right. That's, so that's really that is funny. where the term red flag right. comes from, is wow. they, they paid <laughs> the regulators to get a... And look, the airlines, when the airlines came out, the train companies tried to do a similar thing. When the internet was created, they tried to pass a law that made voice over IP, which we're all using right now, illegal. And you know, Al Gore did not invent the internet, but he did kill that bill. So he does get some credit for helping the internet be created. And yeah. central bank digital currencies, that is not positive for anything, anywhere, no. anyway. It, you know, I, I largely disagree. Santiago says it's history. good for, for adoption even, of even, stables. Even Libra would have been positive for the space. Because it oh, just Libra would be great. Libra's fine. Yeah, but like you could argue but, that Libra is one flavor of, of, of a centralized currency. No, no, um, centralized is okay. It's programmable. Look, Augustine, whatever his name is, the BIS guy who says, yes, we should have the ability to, you get paid today. It's Friday, you get paid. And you go out and you have a few cocktails and drunk text about the president. And we can change the value of your money to 70 cents on the dollar. Or Walmart pays us extra. I, we can change yeah, your I mean, money so it doesn't work. In a Target. place like China, you do have a surveillance state of like true or wheelie and like panopticon of sorts where like, yeah, a social credit system, if the state doesn't agree with you, then it freezes your your money. They can do that with USDC today. Let's just call a spade a spade. But I think you ultimately need to rest your hands on the, the crypto is, it's sort of like, uh, you know, when people start using digital money, I mean, they're gonna, you're going to have, unfortunately or fortunately, a central bank digital currency. It's just going to happen. But it, it always comes down to the rule of law. If you don't have a strong system, it's going to obviously not, not work. It might make it easier for regulators to make your life difficult or like the government. But ultimately, you know, you just have to believe that the U.S. Is, you know, has a strong democracy and different branches of power that have checks and balances. And the only reason why they like freeze your money is because you've done something that is unlawful, but not necessarily, you know, something that is. I know, love the optimism. Protect the certain I, amendment. I do. Obviously, I, obviously, I love the Canada, optimism. I, what I happened it. with the trucking? No, no. Look, I, I get your point. We saw the dangers of that when the truckers in Canada started protesting and they got like their bank accounts frozen. I'm just like being more practical here. That while that. That is true today for, for your bank account. It will be true as well for central bank digital currencies. But I do think it's still net positive for the space in the sense that people get familiar and then say, OK, I have this thing called a central bank digital currency. What else can I do? I have a wallet already set up. You get into this flow habitual of saying, OK, I, I interact with digital money. What else can I do in the space? Oh, well, there's Uniswap and then there's this whole ecosystem of DeFi and I can and, and you start getting a better appreciation for what is and what isn't digital ownership. It raises the level. But of that's why that's things. why the legislation wanted to kill DeFi. And that's that's actually my point, right? Which is, yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna I just want to keep us moving here because again we've got I know we're we've got a hard stop here at the top of the hour or that soon, but uh, I, I want to share my next prediction because I thought that, again, we booked like sort of, six hours for this. We need at least we, six I, hours can, I mean, I can keep going. I'm in, bro, I'm in big I mean, And a couple of beers. Like and or, definitely yeah. a couple of beers. Three yeah. or whatever. I mean, spare me the difficult conversation of, of the holidays with, with family members of like, you know, you go from being the most popular guy in the party in a, for a couple of years and people like begging at you to like which NFT and which asset they should buy to now like Oh, you're in crypto. Oh, we feel yeah. really sorry. For it's you, the same man. tone. It's like, you know, oh, like, God, how going? are you doing? How are you doing? Yeah. It's I'm like, like, guys. Everyone talks to you like a, you know like what? a beloved now family I'm... member just passed away. It's like, you know. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, All right. I'm taking us into the next. Mike, I want to get your next. I've yeah. got a prediction because it actually dovetails with uh, DeFi and what you were saying about exchanges. So I've got Great. one that I think is like slightly more obvious. And then I want to just take a stab at something. So I think MEV is going to emerge as the dominant. Uh, business model for DeFi. And I think that's ultimately going to lead to exchanges vertically integrate and extracting profits from uh, from MEV. So basically, um, if you look back at like the internet, all these different things that could have worked, right? There are three dominant business models that ended up emerging. There was 
advertising vis-a-vis -vis Google, Facebook. There was SaaS, which you get basically from like the Microsoft package and Salesforce. And there were platforms like Airbnb and Uber. E-commerce is kind of a distant fourth. A lot of folks struggled to ultimately make that work. Um, I think something similar is going to happen in crypto. And I think when you look at DeFi protocols in general, uh, there is something that I think people miss, especially around like the Uniswap debate is around like the fee switch is that's ultimately never how those protocols are going to monetize. There's a very strong stated fee preference in TradFi to have more variable fees, like the AUM percentage that you pay uh, to an RIA or wealth manager and fees that are hidden, like payment for order flow as opposed to upfront trading, right? So Robinhood kind of put the final nail in that coffin and then on Fidelity, you can trade whatever. That doesn't mean that value isn't being extracted from financial markets and trading, it just means they're doing it in a more hidden way. That the same thing is going to happen basically for MEV, right? So instead of an upfront fee that you're going to have to pay to trade on Uniswap, ultimately what Uniswap is going to do, and this I'm borrowing a little bit here from uh, Daniel Ellitzer's like Unichain sort of idea, is that uh, Uniswap is going to say, hey, look, we've got all these users that come to our platform. Ultimately, we don't, we got to find a way to monetize. We're not going to charge a fee, but being on Ethereum is very costly. So what we're going to do is we're going to create our own set of validators, right? We're, we're big enough. We're going to bootstrap that. We're going to arrange and order the transition, the transactions on the back end, and that's how we're going to extract fees. And I'm not necessarily making a prediction about like I think app chains ultimately end up winning. I think Ethereum and Cosmos. Who knows? Maybe they'll follow the DYDX route. I think what's more likely is there's some sort of weird shared security model with layer twos or roll apps. But that ultimately the dominant business model for all of these DeFi things, and I think part of the reason they've been beaten up so badly is that business model hasn't been clear, but now I think it is, it's going to be MEV and extracting uh, profits by transactions. The logical next step, if you think about that for Coinbase or Kraken or some of these other exchanges is also to say, we also want to get in on this game because Uniswap, for as big as their volumes are, Coinbase has 60 million customers. And the biggest thing that they get beat up on their stock on is, hey, that uh, fee that you're charging retail, which they're pretty notorious for, that's eventually going to go away. They're going to need to find something to replace it. They Their subscription services line item is never going to grow, I don't think, to the point where their business is going to be valued on it. Instead, they need to switch to a model where they get involved with MEV and they extract some of those profits that they're generating by all the customers that they have trading on their platform. And that's either going to lead to MEV teams at exchanges, or it's going to lead to maybe one exchange is actually going to launch their own chain, I think, and start extracting these profits that way. That is my, that's my prediction, but I'd love to get your guys' thoughts on that. Stunned them in I like silence, that. I like Mike. that. Predi I like, <laughs> well done, buddy. No, no, I like, I like that. <laughs> no, there are a couple, there are a couple, couple things in there. I, I love that prediction. I think, um, I think MEV is going is like the business model right now. Well, like if you look at a lot of the block building strategies in ETH, it's entirely focused on like arbitraging MEV. Um, I, I do think one implication of this is that MEV extraction, this is like an optimistic one, but like MEV extraction actually starts to flow towards, yeah, the users and the broadcasters maybe in like pass through ways through things like Uniswap or something like that. Fees go to zero and like Uniswap takes, takes the fees um, for themselves. I, I, like, I like that pr prediction. I do think because of things like MEV, you will see an exponential increase in the percentage of transactions that happen in on like private chains or like percentage, the percentage of private transactions versus transactions in the public mempool will, it's a, it, like all transactions have usually happened in the, in the, pub, in the public, but I think in 2023, it will more and more will happen in, in uh, private transactions. But I don't even yeah. think that's going to matter. That's a good point, like, Michael. I think, oh, okay. Sorry, just just one note, like Manifold, right, who kind of does this, right? They've got to monetize somehow too. So they're going to sell access to those private transactions. Someone's going to internalize it the same way that Citadel Securities does it in public markets today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I was going to say that really, I think when you look at DeFi, I think the biggest criticism has been what is going to be the monetization of these governance tokens? Like what is the, and I think governance tokens have been, it's been a dance around the lack of regu like navigating this regulatory uncertainty. Again, if you believe that there's going to be like, we've discussed this in the past, like maybe there is a pathway where things can be this hybrid kind of, you just get comfortable around registration and information rights that a token issuer can do. And there's a clear pathway that the SEC puts forth where 
hey, look, DeFi protocols can actually be securities or whatever you want to call this. As long as you know you have two things, market integrity and fairness, right? And proper disclosures is what consumer protection is really all about and creating fair, transparent markets where everyone has an equal footing. In many ways, everything is programmatically encoded. So like a lot of this information is in the public. You know, if you read a smart contract, the SEC has created an information department that I think is is telling us that they're recognizing that maybe, okay, if things are securities, I think we tend to like really be afraid of that. And I think a lot of these DeFi tokens have been governance tokens trying to say this is, there's no promise here of anything other than like voting. But it sets the stage for monetization, maybe through MEV and actually just thinking about uh, you know, these protocols have viable business models that I agree with you, Mike, with this, I think is complementary to what you're saying, which is MEB will be the number one source of profit for these, for, for viable DeFi, kind of a viable business model for DeFi protocols. It has been time and time again, put into question by people, right? Like costume and whatnot. They just say, Hey, these are worthless governance tokens. You look at what DJ Spartan has said over time and time again. And I think largely DeFi has underperformed because you're in that limbo of, Okay, DeFi creates a lot of value, but it is leaking via MEB, and and you know the protocol itself is not really capturing anything. It's sort of like a, 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 a yeah. Well, at the end of the day, you're you're the we are moving from TradFi, where there's this seven trillion dollars of of leakage and friction, to CFI ultimately to DeFi. There can't be zero. Right, there has to be money, either you know equity, debt, or claim on cash flow, uh, in order for there to be value. Right, a, a token that simply exists so people can trade it back and forth isn't value. And you know Uniswap, okay, great, it does all this this volume, but if if the token itself doesn't give me a share of the cash flow generated by this DEX, then it doesn't really have the right function. And the other piece that, that needs to happen, I believe, is the, the, the taking a portion of the transaction layer fees and friction and creating an insurance pool, right? The same way FDIC does for, for the banking system is, you know, there has to be some lender of last resort, you know, safety of last resort, whatever it is. And think about every industry in the world. None of them would function without a viable and robust insurance market, right? You could never get a home loan if you couldn't insure your house. You would never drive a car if you couldn't insure it. And yet we speculate in these assets with no promise of, of insurance. And it just doesn't make any sense. So-, so hmm. Do you think so? Do you, Mark, do you think is that a do you think twenty twenty three is the year we finally get insurance in crypto, or at least we start to see the backbone of, of insurance? We're certainly trying. I mean, we've, yeah. we've made two investments, and that's not self serving. I mean, we've made two so, real investments in companies trying to provide that. But I I think it's a hard prediction to make in a year because what you what you need is a whole group of people to say. Yep. Okay, we're in. And to me, it's like that that Raboy tweet in you know October, November of twenty one. Yes, we've all lost our minds, and we're paying too much for these companies. But you go first, and mm -hmm. you know adjust the so, valuation. So on the insurance piece, I, I've been really vocal about this too, Mark. I think that if you look historically, even from like you know expiration times, no industry has taken off without insurance. You know, when we look at last year, there have been roughly six billion of value that has been hacked. Ronin was six hundred billion, and uh, sorry, six hundred million. And you know that a lot of people look at that and say, you know, come back to me when I can actually insure against this stuff. I was thinking of actually, I've been this has been an idea that I've had. I think it needs to be off chain because of the correlation risk. The problem is, and this is what surprised me perhaps the most. This year has been DeFi yields are lower than treasuries. That is irrational. It will have to change. There's three things that need to correct for insurance to be a viable model, right? Because insurance, I think you price it as if you're farming and you're clipping 20% APY, 
Fine, charge me 3, 4, 5%. It makes it viable for the premium to be high enough given the risk. But when DeFi yields in Aave, like, or just across DeFi, are like lower than treasuries, this model, this business model does not exist. It's not economically viable to insure. It's just, it's just not, right? And so, first of all, it's shocking that DeFi yields are lower than treasuries and the ETH staking yield. It just tells you that the amount of like overcorrectedness that you had in wiping out the recursive leverage in the system. But I think in a, in a rational, steady state market, which, you know, is, 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 is what your economics professor tells you, but crypto is neither rational or I guess steady ever. What needs to be treasury should be lower than ETH should be treasuries plus some risk premium. And then DeFi yield should be higher than the ETH staking yield. Otherwise, none of this kind of works. So that will have to correct itself. And it will point. in the yeah. sense that, look, we're teenagers. The whole industry is a teenager. Well, clearly you are, Mark. You have blue pants and purple sweater. And you can see. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, well, exactly. And I'm, I, I'm just hanging out with young people to keep myself young. It's, it's the Dorian Gray approach. And I sap your, your youthful energy. But no, but here's my point. I, and I talk about this and people get mad at me. I used to, I used to tweet out a picture of nine-year-old LeBron James. And I would say, how much would you pay for the future earnings of this kid? And he looked like a normal nine-year-old kid. He wasn't actually really tall. He wasn't really big. People say, oh, that, that's, that's terrible. I'm like, no, no. I'm saying that how much would you pay for the potential? Okay. Because you have the actual capability of anything versus its potential. And when you are young, your potential is higher than your actual right, efficiency or effectiveness. And so we're... I will argue a decade in because the first four years to me don't really count because it was kind of a science project and wasn't really robust. But we're, let's say we're 14. If we're 14 years in to a multi hundred year evolution, then our capability today versus our potential of the future is, is very low. And I think that's okay. And so, it's yes, it's frustrating that we can't like all realize that yes, one pool is a huge advantage over lots of little pools. Like you think of healthcare insurance. Every company has to have their own pool. That's ridiculous. Every state has their own pool. That's ridiculous. There should be one giant pool, and that's when insurance costs go low, the effectiveness goes up. But that's not good for who? It's not good for the people who process the claims. Which, by the way, best performing stock in the S and P over the last decade, United Healthcare, a company that should not even exist. All they are is a claims processor. There's nothing to do with health or care. They basically pay big money to the government to get a license to steal from all the participants that they get their insurance that way. Um, that doesn't need to be the path for crypto, but you need. I love I love your point about it needs to be off chain. If you have a, a separate it's correlation. entity, composability is your worst enemy when you're trying to insure stuff. Now, claims processing is just purely how the smart contract behaves. It's quite predictable. There's no ambiguity in terms of in terms of saying, "Oh, you know what? You didn't read the clause." Like if there was a hack, it's very clearly the smart contract. We all understand this technically, practically too correlated. Nexus is never going to work. This it never is going to go into scale. Uh, I want to go back to one point because people look. Let, let's make this exciting for people, right? We talk about smart contracts, claims process. People, we're going to put people to sleep here, which is maybe a good thing, you know. But uh, free melatonin is what I tell people when, when you want to have free melatonin. Just listen to Empire. So, anyways, I think people want to say, okay, have we bottomed? People are going to ask us this question time and time again. I don't have a I don't have a crystal ball. I mean, I, I tend to look at rest my case on fundamentals, the need for decentralization. There's all these secular trends. Over the next five, 10 years, you start seeing great entry points. But nonetheless, my I've said this in Empire time and time again. I thought the bottom was going to be a billion. Uh, sorry, a trillion market cap. Revise that down a trillion to one, one T. I revised that down to 800 when Terra happened because I thought that was a huge blow, secular, specific to the industry that needed to 
you know, that I had to adjust. And I said, it's going to probably go down to 800. We're at 840 now. It feels like we're consolidating. Michael, I agree with your point. Uh, I think there are a couple of things, I think probabilistically, a couple of things that are continue to be irrational are Luna still trades at a billion. FTX still trades at 280 million. Celsius trades at 360 million. And Voyager at 90 million market cap. That should all be zero. Okay. I give it to two much bigger ones, right? I've said over and over, and I'm, I'm, I'm regretting it now because I'm like, the bear market can't end. Crypto winner can't end until Doge and Shiba are zero. No, I disagree. Ooh, yeah, I disagree. All right. Because yeah. I, I largely disagree because there is value in memes. A lot of oh, oh, explain. Oh, yeah. Come on, bring it. Explain yeah. that to me. I'm so the, on the fence about this. Well, I, 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 got, I, I, got, I got so much criticism around this, but I think when I tweeted, look, I think there's been this idea that in crypto, we try to, yes, emphasize the pure, pristine qualities from a technical standpoint is a huge breakthrough. And somehow we feel really dirty when we say there is a lot of entertainment value. When you deliver entertainment, there is a lot of value. Netflix is a very valuable company. They produce, they started producing killer content. Las Vegas, there's value there. People want to be entertained. Obviously, gaming is a component of that, but the value of just, there is also the ability to speculate and humans always wanting to speculate and you're allowing that to happen. It's not sex. It's not nice, but it is a big component of why people come to crypto. Let's just accept that. And as long okay. as we accept that and we're honest about that, right. I think we'll just kind of move on. Right? I mean, I'll actually, no, I'll, you know, I'll actually accept that. It's no different than Tesla. A very powerful right? way to convey Tesla shares are simply a speculative vehicle, right? The, the company, yeah, like, like you, can't, you, of, you, can't, the, you can't get their value. Since 2008, the market has not traded rationally. Like, like yeah, let's just fair. accept that. People try to like, make mental gymnastics of discounted cash flow terminal value it's all bullshit you're the gold seeking for oh. something that it's like people have oh. thrown away it's actually what a stock is crushed. but but okay, okay other than the fact that that's what an equity Fine. actually is okay okay i'll, I'll How go do with you your i'll go with your definition Mark, of bullshit these huge p ratios of like just way out of whack and like amazon has never turned a profit other than aws but most of their like business lines have never the unit economics are terrible. You just cannot justify in your right mind from a fundamental standpoint how things trade. What's going on, guys? Want to give a quick shout out to this episode's sponsor, Curve. They are the one-stop shop credit cards that helps you take control of your personal finances. Here's the reason that I personally love this company. These guys are all about helping you manage and maximize your personal cash flow. We have been talking for the last couple of months about everything that the Fed is doing with raising interest rates. Obviously, this is not, no one's got a crystal ball. This is not financial advice, but I think it makes sense more than ever now for companies to be managing their cash flow and for you as an individual to be managing your personal cash flow as well. Curve makes it super, super easy to do that. Even I can do it as a technological Philistine. They aggregate all of your spending information in one place. They make it super easy to plan, but they actually go one step further than that. They have a very cool feature called go back in time, which allows you to switch payments from one card to another. So if you have an unexpected expense crop up, boom, you can move that over to your credit card, free up some cash. Or maybe you learned too late that you could have earned more rewards by spending on a different card. Boom, Curve has you covered there too. And the last thing that I'll say is, if you click the link at the bottom of this episode, you'll get $20 in Curve cash, but you'll only get that if you click the vanity link at the bottom of this episode. Plus, that gives me the credit as well. So thank you, Curve. I appreciate you caring about cash flow. Guys, click the link at the bottom of this episode. Tell them I sent you. The, the only thing I want to say is I think we bar bottom at 700 to 800, even though you might have DCG tether might be like a really big blow. I think the other thing that I would just wanted to comment on was it does people talk about the flipping of ETH versus Bitcoin. I think that ETH has been considerably stronger and, and resilient. The transition to proof of stake, there are criticisms around censorship of the proof of stake model, but the, the idea that it was successfully delivered on the merge is very powerful. L Layer twos are a huge setup for mainstream adoption. I think alternative L1s are struggling, not dead, but struggling. And I think uh, Ethereum is going to get much more love and you could probably credibly see a flipping with Bitcoin. 
like, like right. the value proposition of digital gold versus that's the a internet good that's is, a good prediction it's a good prediction and it, I, I what I like about it is it it helps me with you know I I have voiced on many occasions my you know three scenario mental model right I mean I talk about the internet the internet yeah internet, internet protocol and then that's the very base but then on top of that you got TCP IP then you got FTP to transfer files SMTP for email HTTPS for uh, websites and then www dot that ties it all together. And I can't decide whether we have that model, a stacked protocol stack where Bitcoin's the base layer and then Filecoin sits on top of that, like FTP. Then you got Ethereum is the www dot. And then something wins for SMTP, HTTP. Is it Cosmos? Is it Solana? Is it Avalanche? Is it Polkadot? I don't know. Or are the maxis right? And it's Bitcoin, Lightning, L3, L4, whatever. Or is it a bunch of L1s and bridges? And what Santiago says, to, what I hear is it's it's scenario one that it's you know Bitcoin and Ethereum. You don't. And then why would you need wins. Bitcoin when you like Ethereum is a settlement layer, like the same as Bitcoin? Like like you're you're. You just don't need Bitcoin in the scenario. Like, like I'm, I'm not saying that Bitcoin goes to zero. I think, again, this idea of digital gold can ossify over some decades, I guess. But, but I think like the the use case of the sediment layer and fabric of the internet doesn't it doesn't need to replace something. It just sort of weaves in right into something that the internet never solved, which was transacting and. and Like, I don't want to get into this huge debate, but I do think that, look, they, as everything, it depends. It depends. And and it's a bit early to, to call it a day, but I do think that, like, the thing that Ethereum just generally proof of stake systems are going to have to solve is this, this, this tendency to cluster. The same with the proof of work can. Generally speaking, distributed systems have a, probably a natural tendency to centralize. And so you have to counteract that. Um, and, and I think that the challenge for Ethereum will have to be, how do you, how do you like remove this centralization uh, and censorship? Uh, and I do agree with you in that respect, Bitcoin is stronger today. Yeah. Can, can I make a I'm pro, not, again, pro we, Bitcoin argument? Because I always, no. I always, I feel like I always come down on the side of Ethereum. But one thing that I wish I heard the Bitcoin people say that I just never hear enough is Bitcoin has decided to compete on a monetary angle and ETH has decided to compete on a technological angle. I don't hear anyone talking about that threat. Like Bitcoin is basically in a league of its own. It's the original app chain. It's the store of value money app chain. And it's the only one that does proof of work. People are like, is proof of work or proof of stake better? I think there are merits to both, but Bitcoin is the only one doing proof of work and now everyone is doing proof of stake. That's, so just in terms of the competition that you have mm -hmm. out there, Bitcoin is going to win. Bitcoin also, Santiago, to your point, has meme value. Bitcoin has won on the hard money store mm -hmm. value meme. Sorry. I think this whole thing that ETH is trying to go down of deflationary money, ultrasound money is a losing argument. They're just never going to win that. It's already in oh, look, I did the mind. bankless thing. It's money printer go burr. Yeah. I, I think, no, I just, I, I love, I love the bankless guys. And I, I understand that ETH can become deflationary, but I just think, I think the meme value of it, I think Bitcoin is going to have to break its hard cap and tail emissions. And I still think it's going to win the hard mm -hmm. money use case. I just think it's already exactly. cemented. Um, it's Let me my go biggest back criticism to one thing, with Michael, it. on that. It's because so they've, cool. they've like cordoned themselves off, but they've won this use case. Okay. Well, like, can we just like, can we just step back from it and say, when you say it's one, that does is, is sort of like in juxtaposition with saying, we all believe here that this industry is so small and is a speck of dust as a NASA class. So you can't really say it's like won the battle. Like, like you know what I mean? I This is why I struggle with any sort of maximalism thinking here, which is, God, like it is so hard to build in crypto because you don't understand the real user base. God damn it. There's like 10 people using DeFi protocols and a couple, maybe a million people using NFTs. Like, you know what I mean? Like it's nothing. No, but you're, you're okay. But, but Santiago here, here, no, here's the thing. You said earlier that, that you didn't see the the dollar losing its reserve status well let me let me posit something gold 
is the only money that exists in the world. Money is an asset that exists in the absence of a liability. Okay. Gold is the only thing to this point that, that has survived time. There've been a lot of things that have been money over time, puka shells and stone wheels, et cetera, but gold has survived for 5,000 years. Everything else on top of it, the things that we think of as money sits on top of gold. Gold is held by central banks. Central banks then create currency out of thin air, used to be backed by gold, no longer backed by gold, but they create fed wire money. Okay. Not money, currency backed by debt. Each country has their own version of it. Green, yellow, red, whatever. Here's the interesting thing. I will argue that Bitcoin came along and solved the two shortcomings of gold portability and divisibility. Like if I had a bar of gold and I were a strong guy, I'm not a very strong guy, but if I could break it into four pieces, share it with y'all. Problem is I couldn't break it, right? Physically, I just couldn't do it. Second, if I tried to stuff it in the computer, it wouldn't go. So with Bitcoin, punch a couple buttons, I could send you the equivalent of a quarter bar of gold in Bitcoin, easy. So I'll argue that the Bitcoin replaces gold as the base layer of money. Now, what does that mean? It means that over time, central banks will adopt it. It means that then all the fiat, back to your point about CBDCs, will occur. I agree they will. Most of them will be sinister, but, but they will occur. And they will sit on top in the fiat layer above the base layer. Now, where's Ethereum fit into this? Well, I don't think it can displace Bitcoin as the base layer. I think Ethereum can be all of the things on top all of the transactional things that we use as currencies or payment rails. Um, but that, that's how I really think about the difference. And the one subtlety is I actually think the dollar is going to lose. The renminbi mm -hmm. will become the next reserve currency. It won't be Bitcoin. Bitcoin has got 70, 80, 100 years to go before it gets there. But the renminbi, the Chinese want that mm -hmm. to be the case. It's already in the China. SDR. There's two great books on guys. China. I'm, I, I don't want to get into a. I don't. I don't want to get into a global reserve currency. We always deba yeah. debate. No, here. no, we don't. But there, yeah. there's two good. There's two, you know what I mean? Like I, I, I had that view, Mark. I'll just encourage you if you haven't read the book um, on. It's called On China, not Kissinger. There's another book on when China rules the world by a French historian. China has never had imperialistic ambitions. It just wants to secure natural resources. And the second one is this guy Peter Zahan. Terrible. And his book. book is the end. I hate it. Well, look, I don't agree. <laughs> no, with no, I know. I, I, look, I, Peter and I don't. I mean, I don't, we just have different Peter opinions. Peter can be really radical. But... And look, I'm not American, but I do think that he brings up purely the point on demographics over the next 20 years and how that informs your view of who. China has a huge demographic problem and, and the U.S. doesn't. And for that well, reason, I think it, you could argue. It does, but it doesn't. The thing that status. he doesn't talk about, which is, I think, wrong. He, he, he rightfully talks about the aging boomers, their boomer population is bigger than our boomer population, but he doesn't mention the fact that we have 80 million millennials, of which you three mm -hmm. are part of that. They have 330. They have 330 million millennials. Most of them used to be in abject poverty. Now they're in the lower and upper middle class. And he doesn't talk about that. And that's the part that, that I think is a little disingenuous. But again, back to Yano's point, let's not, let's not debate that, but let's get a... back to a couple big yeah. Can I just Predictions. frame? Because I, I don't actually think you guys are disagreeing on Bitcoin versus Ethereum, by the way. Like crypto, first of all, is like a, a very technical space. And I think people over index on technical arguments a lot. Like there's this proof of work or proof of stake better. I'm approaching this from a brand standpoint. I think every big brand of which Bitcoin and Ethereum are both brands, you get one word that is associated with you, just one. And the problem is what has served Ethereum so well in part is this transition of proof of stake and faster transactions and blah, 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 they are fang and Bitcoin is gold. And you don't get to be both in people's minds. That's just not how brands work. I just, I just don't think ETH will compete yeah. on its own separate scale. And I actually, if this is the same reason why I hate this whole argument about everything's going to be built on Bitcoin. That's not the brand. The brand is safety, security, gold, hard money. And then the brand on ETH is innovation, new use cases, smart contracts, fang. And I, I don't that. So it's not like a, I don't have a small, 
I, I just think that those are the chosen markets and ways that they've decided to position themselves and compete. And I think those, I don't think those trajectories are going to change. I think those cement, those trajectories at least are and cemented. Nor are they mutually exclusive. Nor are they mutually exclusive. So I very much agree with that. All right. Let's, uh, in the theme of like other big predictions, you know, I know you have, you'd have a couple predictions here. So do you, you got anything that's going to get the people to stand up? You got any spicy ones for us here? <laughs> I have one. All right. So I'll, I mean, I can just share a couple of mine. I've got, I think there's going to be complete Bitcoin miner comp capitulation. I don't think this is a, is a unique take, but I mean, conditions for Bitcoin miners are just not to continue down the Bitcoin rabbit hole too much, but like it's bad right now and it's just getting worse, right? We have like higher in, uh, input costs. We have lower output value. We have elevated energy prices. We have just this like highly stressed economic environment. Um, that's, been really bad for Bitcoin miners and it's going to continue that way. And right, if you look at the data right now, I think this was from, I think I saw this on Glassnode, Bitcoin miners are selling 150% of their coin every day, which means that they're not only liquidating their entire supply of newly mined coins, but now they're having to dip into their Bitcoin reserves. So uh, I think that's, that's one prediction I'd have. I think another pred prediction would be, um, there, every four years we see wars in crypto. So 2017, you had the exchange wars, like Binance came onto the scene, came after Coinbase, like just these big, you know, big exchange wars. That was 2017. 2021, we saw, um, and 2020 was the L1 wars, right? Like Solana, AVAX, obviously Luna blew up, but like Luna, like Terra ecosystem, like that was the L1 war. And I think we're gonna see the wallet war. Um, and if you look at wallets today, the wallet experience is so bad right now. The, and, and the reason is because there's no competition. There's only one player. It's MetaMask, right? You have like, like MetaMask has basically dominated wallets for the last several years. But I think now we're going to see these like big wallet wars, uh, not in 2023, but like starting to emerge in 2023, but really into 2024. And you have folks like Phantom, uh, Argent, Brave, uh, the big players are launching their own wallets. So like Ledger launched a wallet, Coinbase launched a wallet. Uh, I bet I bet Uniswap launches a wallet. And then there's new ones popping onto the scene that are raising money that I'm seeing some like interesting pitches for. So I think, uh, I think, and then account abstraction. I think like one of the big buzzwords of next year is going to be like smart contract wallets with like account abstraction. I think that's going to uh, introduce like a really good user flow to wallets that we haven't seen so far. So that'd be my other predictions that um yeah like just what wallets i don't pile on that that i i actually think it's the end of the hot wallet um beginning of the end and that that we're moving to the browser slash iphone moment and i actually think it it is the the ledger stacks but there there are some competitors but look the internet was a horrible experience until mark andreessen created the browser the mobile net was a horrible experience until Apple created this. And now we're all going to have an HSM. We're all going to carry it. Now, it should be this, right? Apple should have an enclave and Android should have an enclave and it should be air gapped and all that stuff. But they're not going to do it because they won't give up the good to go for the great. So it's going to be a new entry. And, and, I, and I do think the wallet moment, but I think hard wallet rather than, than hot wallet, is the bit the big trend that we're all mm -hmm. going to carry around an HSM? Yeah, we we had a good discussion on the Solana phone, and that kind of thinking I think will be very rewarded, whether it's a Solana phone or you know um, some other phone. But I do think that uh, that uh, just I think the value proposition most people naturally gravitate towards a hot wallet because it's just so easy to set up. But by default, I think you're going to have uh, um, HSM in your phone. And, and I think that, you know, covers two thirds of the world's population. So, um, the other, just to, I think those are great predictions, Jason, which I largely agree with the other one, I think I was thinking a lot about, you know, for putting macro to the side, I think what, what was a big, you always, I think need catalysts to spur the next run. It was DeFi, uh, and then NFTs, uh, last cycle, I think next cycle will be gaming. Um, I think that is going to be, you look at, you know, Yuga Labs, uh, hiring the Activision Blizzard, 
uh, executive. I think that is, I think, continue to see a lot of human capital and like really good developers, really good gaming folks enter the space. I think there's a lot of really cool stuff happening there. Again, I think people have not been very patient because it takes time, a lot of time to build killer games, but they're going to come. They're really well capitalized teams. Um, the second quick prediction that I'd make is I think there's going to be a lot of consolidation. Probably two thirds of the startups are going to die. Aqua hired. The other thing is Coinbase probably gets acquired. I mean, it's sitting at $8 billion. Uh, maybe this is at some point a JP Morgan comes in and sweeps it. I think it has regulatory moats. It has brand power. It's synonymous with buying crypto in the U S I just think that at some point it's going to become an acquisition target and I'm people praying that does not, not happen. I really, I hope. Yeah. I, hope I mean, it's just, I, it's just trading at a pretty attractive place for, I think a, a, an incumbent to, to get a leg up on, on and, oh, fast crypto. and, and look, it, it's, you know, it's trading at the same value as it is as when it raised money privately right. uh, last round in 2018. Mm-hmm. It's got five times as many users. It's got, you know, almost 10 times as much revenue, even though. Revenues yeah, I think down. U.S. regulated exchanges are shining in this whole fiasco of FTX and a couple other exchanges abroad. I mean, I think it has Kraken and Coinbase, uh, probably Kraken IPOs at some point. Uh, Jesse's departure or moving into a chairman role and. I think is setting up and setting a stage for an IPO at some point. Um, but yeah. I have a, I have a prediction that sort of dovetails. I actually want to push back a little Jason on the, your minor prediction. I think it's the bottom for miners already. Like, I don't think it gets worse from here. I think this is about as bad as it gets. Like also, if you look at, you can see Bitcoin treasuries.org, you can see the amount that miners actually still have on their balance sheets. Um, it's not ultimately even that much that they still have. And uh, what was, Core Scientific, the largest I think North American Bitcoin miner, just went bankrupt. And part of this is the thing that traditionally happens. Usually, when there's a bankruptcy of a big company like that, those mark those are the bottoms instead of like you know the what what's to come. So I think it's the end of bit pain for Bitcoin miners. I really agree with your prediction on wallet wars um, because if you think about like Ben Thompson, Ben Thompson, the stratechery guy, he talks about like aggregation theory that plays like plays in a we haven't seen that play out much in crypto, but I think that still applies to crypto, basically. Like if you control the relationship with the customers, ultimately I think you're that's a much more valuable thing than the the farther you are away from the customer, the more your business is going to get commoditized. And I think that leads actually into uh I think there's going to be if there's going to be MA in crypto, I think it's going to be vertical integration as opposed to horizontal integration. Like I think businesses, yeah, yeah, because so, yeah. there's no new uh, consumers yeah. entering into the space, what they're going to do is say, we're not going to get more consumers. How can we squeeze more margin out mm-hmm. of the stack And companies that have a lot of uh, like have big customer bases, basically will try to vertically integrate other parts of their stack. That sort of yeah, is like yeah. the app chain thesis, yeah. but I actually think you might see like a big wallet provider make some acquisitions further yeah. downstream. Well, Michael, I, I, I'm glad you brought that up because that was my last prediction. You're already starting to see that to some extent. DY, DY DX departing from Ethereum and trying to build their own, I think, is, is is indicative of that. The other one is step in, right? Which is, I think, there will be this from a go to market standpoint. If you're someone like Step In, had a lot of early traction, became the number one app at Solana, then it was breaking Solana, then it, and so, what's to stop them from them building their own chain and really owning? the full user experience and capturing more value. So they've now launched an NFT marketplace. Uh, they started with a wallet, but then have expanded. And what's to stop them from building their own L1? I mean, it, there's really not much when you just fork and, and own really the user experience um, because a lot of times it becomes difficult, right? When you're competing for block space and that tension continues to exist, um, even though gas fees have come down dramatically, right? And you have L2s that can support that. But there's always going to be, I think, a slightly higher skew and incentive for a project, consumer-facing projects that are going to be the ones that really dominate to go out and build their own chain and own and be vertically integrated and really be very tight in in managing the user experience end-to-end. And so I think that's going to be something that... uh, is going to be a big trend over the next couple yeah. of years. I'll I'll add one thing to that. So I to to like the prediction around wallets there actually, and and this vertical integration. I think wallets in the past were only about holding crypto assets. It was like just the place that you held your crypto assets. 
I think we are moving into a world with like what you guys are talking about with vertical integration and with wallets getting better and better, account abstraction getting introduced, where the wallet experience is going to feel more like your digital home instead of just like the place you own your crypto assets. Um, and Santi, you mentioning step and brought like made me think about that. Like with the introduction of like ENS, soulbound tokens, POAPs, decentralized social, um, all these brands. Actually, one of my predictions for the year was also like all these brands are every brand's gonna launch a digital collectible. It's like the next era of the of the NFT space. Um, like with the introduction of brand NFTs, um, I think the wallet experience will just feel like your digital home instead of the place you hold your your ETH. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's your digital identity. Completely yeah. agree, and and it's everything, right? Literally, your identity, right. your reputation status. will live inside the wallet. Uh, yeah. yeah, and you know, I think the big thing is is this idea that um, NFT is not a monkey JPEG, right? <laughs> it's, it's kind of what it got labeled as: is this, you know, it's a collectible or digital art. Mm-mm. NFT is simply a line item on a ledger. And it is a way to own everything. So it's digital property rights and it's going to eventually be everything, right? Every asset, every stock, every bond, every currency, every commodity, every piece of art, every piece of real estate, every collectible car, every medical record, right? I mean, the idea that today that we don't control our own medical record is just insane, right? Why do these two big behemoth companies that don't talk to each other and I tell the the story that my mom almost almost died because of the you know they couldn't get her medical yeah, record because the one mistake. system wouldn't talk to the other. It's just ridiculous, right? And now there's even a more scary. Yes, thing. but you need um you need privacy, which is no no a hundred percent and and pri- uh, that that is a prediction I will make is that privacy uh, coins, privacy tokens, privacy protocols are going to make a big move. And they'll move out of the shadows. Like I just said, I I used to joke, or I I, I mean, I joke. I used to laugh when the the government types said, "Oh, you know, crypto is only used by terrorists and and money launderers." I had no idea they had inside information and that they were the large money launderers. So yes, it was. But now these privacy coins, privacy tokens, I think will will have much more important use cases because. At the end of the day, I I love the fact that I can transact T instant uh, anywhere globally, borderless, fine. But the idea that someone can then go into my uh, wallet and look, or into my entry and see everything I own, like the, the this company we invested in, actually they do data analysis on chain. They went to the Gary V. Uh, VCon, you know, has a big event. You had, I don't know, 24,000 people go to this thing and they all had to buy an NFT to, to get in. Well, by putting your wallet to that NFT, you opened up all of your transactions and history and ownership and they could actually it's a perfect, do... Uh, it's a perfect cookie. It's a perfect cookie because it, it, you can't erase it. And I mean, there's no surprise amazing. why brands are coming into the space, right? I mean, when Tiffany airdrops you an NFT when you enter the store and sees that you own all the, you know, a couple million dollars of NFTs, well, they have a pretty good understanding of your, your who you are better than Google Analytics. So, Amen. So Amen. And so Web3 Metaverse. Into the premium, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> we got the permies, baby. No, I'm kidding. I, I think the, the, the last thing I'll... The permies, well, that's what, right. Yeah. Stable dovetailing on on stable. The only thing I want to say is, I think one of the more unexplored but things that will really take off finally is payments. Uh, you know, Visa coming into account abstract. I think payments really is one of those. When you first come into crypto, it always seems so obvious. It's like, wow, to your, what you just said, Mark, borderless, frictionless. All these kind of like the traditional financial system is putting, trying to stitch together a clusterfuck of things that don't talk to each other really well. 70 year old technology. Um, Visa yeah. runs on a mainframe so, computer written in COBOL. Yeah, so I think, uh, COBOL. I, think, uh, com- I think payments will really uh, take off. But again, you need regulation. I've, I've, got, I've got one. This one's pretty out. I haven't heard anyone talk about anything like this, but I think basically, I think we're going to see the rise of professional like basically guilds essentially of skilled labor that organizes itself into distinct sections. So let me tell you why I think this is going to happen. Basically what happened 
uh, in 20, like DeFi summer took off because of yield farming where people wanted to attract liquidity to their platform. Now there's a much bigger push towards labor. Yeah, we don't really want this mercenary liquidity where we got, we, we give you a bunch of our tokens and you just dump it on the open market. That was like good for a while, but it didn't ultimately work. Now what we want is people actually contributing because of the ways that DAOs are structured today. They're, what are they, do? you know, we're, we're seeing calls for a more professional class of delegates, right? And you also need skilled labor. The problem with labor is it's not fungible like capital is. Someone needs to underwrite that labor. And I think what you're ultimately going to see is either DAOs or these big associations of people who do this sort of thing, right? They look sort of like a mix between like, go look up guilds, like the blacksmiths guild or that, or whatever. I think you're, ult you're going to see that in crypto and they're going to wield actually an enormous pound amount of power. Um, and there's going to be a balance between labor and capital that exists in more traditional markets between like unions and people who own and manage companies and equity. And I think that same dynamic is going to crop up in crypto. That bodes really well for the current labor structure and what people don't want to go back to traditional work and working from home. Right. And certainly Web3 it's... open source systems really enable that. Yeah. Well, look, ultimately, someone's going to crack the nut that... Um your skill set has value, your accomplishments have value, your uh, expertise has value. And your on-chain activity has value. Yeah, your on-chain activity has value. And my, my big thing is like Twitter, right? If I like a tweet and it's on nutrition, it has no value. There's no value in me liking that tweet because I have no expertise in nutrition. Um, it's just my personal opinion. If I like a tweet on asset allocation, I would like to think I might be adding some value there. And so, but yet every like is the same, right? Every user is the same. It's like jobs, right? We count jobs by job. Well, an IBM executive making $200,000 a year is different than a barista. It just is. It doesn't, just, I'm not saying it's good or bad, it just, but they're different. And they have different impact on, on you know, the, the economy. And yet we, we look at the jobs number and we just count the number of jobs. No, there's a quality level of jobs. There's a quality to a like. There's a quality to a participant in a network. There's a quality to expertise or, or guild membership. And so, and, and communities, in fact, that's why I'm wearing my on-chain monkey socks today, right? I, I value being part of that community, a community that rewards good karma, right? When we see a member of the community do something good, we give them bananas and that's mana to you know, contribute to, to a, a social project. You know, that's a small little thing, but these communities, these guilds, these, these associations and that intermingling of our physical life and our digital life is right. So it's why we're all here. It, it's that it's the excitement of the digital age and this and that mark is why Dogecoin has value. <laughs> <laughs> wow, full circle. Oh. Micah, I'm signing off. All right. That's, That's my contribution. Right. Space. Don't go. None of this is legal financial advice for that matter. I'm not endorsing Dogecoin anyway. I love it. You, I, you know, that was Contact well played. Santi, that was done. well nice played. Mm. That was well played. And on that note, I, I want to look, I we should do this obviously more often. Um, I want to thank blockworks for the privilege of of doing this for the past year i have this is the best hour plus of, of my week i say every week uh i i'm really grateful that, that mike and i've had the platform and yano for you and, and mike to, to to give me that that privilege um i admire what you guys are building i i love this community i love the fact that people give up time every saturday to listen to us and drink their coffee uh, and that means a lot. So I wish all those those people who have like come up to me at crazy places, airports and football games and said, hey, I listen to you guys every Saturday. Um, I wish them all happy holidays uh, and all the best for the new year. Um, it is really a great privilege to be able to do this. Yeah. Highlight of my year as well. You know, we started this project Empire a year ago. And uh, it, it's been, I think, especially in this time of market where Crypto genuinely just needs pure, largely unbiased, just education and awareness. And and it's it's uh, what you guys do here is, is very special. And it, it is the highlight of my week, too. So thank you guys for that. And happy holidays, everyone. And go watch Harry Potter. It's a great time to do it. <laughs>
<laughs> I, I knew it wouldn't be an, uh, an, an end of year review with Santiago if you didn't plug Harry Potter. But Mark and Santiago. You know, he is kind of a debonair Potter. Harry Potter now that I look at him. I mean, other yeah. than the. Yeah, I mean. Wow. I guess Santiago. Hey, Mark, I'll do. I'll do. If you keep. You keep talking like this. I'll do an, empire, an episode with you every week. <laughs> <laughs> um, guys, echo that sentiment. You've given uh, me and Jay, I really appreciate the kind sentiment, Mark, from, from you. I've really enjoyed doing this with you and Santiago. You guys produce great content as well. Appreciate you guys sharing your time with us. And guys, uh, it's been a year. Um, just to conclude, no one has a crystal ball. I go into 2023 firmly stating that I feel optimistic. So I'll be ready to eat those words. But uh, guys, thanks for spending your time with us and uh, we'll see you in the new year. All right. Thanks, guys. Be well.